Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. This week, we're finally hitting the land down under. Yeah, we're really excited to be joined by Bands, the extraordinary TO of the Sydney region. Thanks so much, guys. It's great to be here. Welcome aboard. Excited to have you talk a little bit about some chaotic chaotic teams and find out a little bit more about how you created basically from scratch the Sydney community. It sounds like it's gone from zero to hero in a really short amount of time as far as scenes grow. So I'm sure that me and Jason are both very excited to hear what you've got to say. Oh, yeah, for sure. Can't wait to share it with you. Um, so that is something we are going to dive into pretty much right away. But before that, we do want to shout out our our newest uh, patron, Patreon. Welcome to the Patreon, Thor Mike. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Now we're up to two patrons. Hey, if you want to join this, this small club, get in on the action, you can find the Patreon link in the podcast description and while you're there you can swing by and drop a five-star review we're looking for more of those as well and you'll get access to our special patron only discord channel in our discord just another kill team discord yes and that link will be in the podcast description as well what have you guys been up to outside of uh kill team stuff from my perspective oh man work work is just absolutely slamming me right now it's been school holidays so i've had the kid home (laughs) and been a an extra um challenge um and dynamic into the mix trying to get work and uh kill team sorted but outside of that i've been uh playing a bit of playstation funnily enough and um i've been playing um horizon on playstation vr which is actually really awesome Oh, that does sound fairly cool. I haven't actually done any VR stuff with the PlayStation, so it works works well. Oh, it works really well. So P- PS, oh, well, VR, PSVR two is is a huge upgrade from VR one. So it's just been you know really smooth with regards to the graphics, less gran- less granular inside, so really crisp. What about you, Jason? What have you been up to? You know, uh, I can super duper relate to that because I've been super busy with work lately as well. Um, This upcoming weekend that will have passed by the time this episode comes out is our all time busiest weekend with the company that I'm working with like ever. Um, So it's been a little bit hectic, um, but, you know, we're, we're having lots of fun. Uh, throwing parties all the time is what we do. And uh, other than that, when, with a little bit of downtime that I've had has also been PlayStation. Now that I got, like, I was playing Doom Eternal before, I hit a point where it seems pretty end game. There's a bunch of bosses at once, and I was like, you know what? Let's put a pin in this and go play Doom, the 2016 version. Uh, you know, I'm just here for my easy mode casual video games. Well, <laughs> just not ready to fight four bosses at once. What about you, Travis? Uh, I actually been catching up on TV shows. Ooh, TV shows. Yeah, I've finished uh, Ahsoka and I finished the One Piece live action, and I was surprised that I really enjoyed the One Piece live action, considering I've been reading One Piece since I was like sixteen. <laughs> I'm substantially older than that now. And then for Ahsoka, it got a little slow, but the ending was pretty good, and it was I like it more than I like Mandalorian, so I, pre- I enjoyed it. So some TV. Yeah. Uh, you know, but we're really excited to talk about Australia today. We're, I think we're going to go into a little bit of tactics for, I think, Warp Coven later on in the podcast. But I think the big topic today is Australia. We've been trying to set up this podcast for a while now. I think bands, we we got in contact maybe, what, three months ago? Yeah, a while back now, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, since then, you've gone on to run four really large tournaments this year? Yeah, Or maybe not in the last three months, but like... This year, you've done around four tournaments, right? Yeah, that's correct. So, so probably since the start of the year in, in January, um, ran our first sizable uh, ITC um, over at an organization or a store called The Combat Company. Shout out to those guys for hosting it for us. It was our first. Um, and that was received really well. There were smaller tournaments um, down south side prior. So Sydney had pockets of um community but they were very uh, segregated so it was very siloed and um what we were trying to do is is just bring everyone together and um what would have been maybe potentially 30 people uh, across sydney playing semi-competitively um you know grew to about i think in, in sydney alone right now we've got about 600 people 
um, playing the game at, at different levels. Not all, not all competitively, but um, we've got people who definitely, you know, lean towards the the narrative side of things, and we've got people who still play casually and like just the the fun of the game and the social aspect of it. And then we've got people, you know, who are leaning more into competitive, and 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 they're really starting to come out of the woodwork. Yeah, so. Ran a ran an ITC first ITC in January. Then in March we had our first GT. So grand tournament. We we sold about forty tickets, which was really encouraging. Um, and we had thirty eight people turn up and play on the day, and it was it was a spectacular event. And the community really came together. And um, you know we've been we've been building the community for quite some time. And um, massive shout out to all the area leads who who came together across Sydney and grew their own pockets. Um, after a bit of encouragement, yeah. Since then, it's just grown from strength to strength. It sounds like you've got uh, some hometown heroes locked and loaded then, huh? Definitely, definitely. It's a, it's a team effort, 100%. Yeah, any of those local TOs that you want to shout out while you know we have a little bit of time? Look, so so across the Sydney itself, and it's not just Sydney. So across the country, we've got we've got some tos down south. So massive shout out to our uh, Stuart and Lap who have been doing hard work down there. Um, P1K over in Western Australia, and um, here in Sydney, um, Emma and Christine just just ran their first tournament as well over in the hills, which which was super successful. I couldn't make it, but um, it was run really well. Um, so massive shout out to those guys. And again, the, the area leads like uh, Pixel, uh, Jono, um, Liam, Sam. Uh, we've got we've got a, st- a whole host of people who who really drive the momentum in their in their pockets as well. Yeah, I think it's really important. I think as TOs start taking on more responsibility, it's nice to have extra people that can help either run games or run tutorial things. So I have something similar going on in um, New York. We have a tag on one of our main channels where you can like ask for a mentor to show up and help you out. So shout out to Calvin for helping out with all the new players at my uh, local shop, The Strat. What a legend. Yeah. You know, talking about the, you know, the metas, does Australia have one kind of unified meta or does each of the larger regional cities kind of have their own play styles? Because Australia, for anyone who's not in the know, is a massive physical space. <laughs> it's, a, it's a large block of land for sure. We it don't, is I a could... large block of land. Yeah, no, I couldn't really, I couldn't really say to you or, or pinpoint a particular team or meta people play because they're so diverse in the way they play. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the, um, if you look at the top of the ladder here in Australia, you'll you'll have Liam, you'll have Alexa, you'll have Sam, you'll have Brucey, and all of those guys play different teams. I mean, Sam Sam completely wiped me off the board last night with his um, vet guard. Brucey, Brucey sticks to and swears by um, uh, Void Dancer Troop. Um, Liam will will play, you know, Slanesh Legionaries just to, just to mix it up a bit and get that extra inch of movement. And then Alexa, you know, mixes and matches between Chaos Cults, uh, Gene Stealer Cults, um, and... Um, uh oh Eldar, what is it? the names escaping oh, me? Corsairs. Corsairs, Boyd Scout Corsairs. Yeah. So he'll mix between and 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 the guys will diversify as well. So Sam Sam will turn around and play um Sam will turn around and play Elucidian Star Striders. So there's not one real, you know, meta I could point to in Sydney. In Melbourne, it's very diverse as well. They still play a lot of compendium teams. And over in Western Australia, it's anything goes. No, it's really dependent on what they feel like playing. There's no real, I mean, sure, uh, you know, before data slates hit, you you might see a lot of chaos cults being played, but there wasn't that many um, Helgor Ravages being played before the data slate, you know, dropped. Um, there was a, there was a few uh, Gilipox infected players, but but nothing really where where a data slate displaced a few players. So that's that's something we didn't experience. Man, that's good. I mean, I think in you know the northeast where I'm from, there's a lot of players that play the, whatever the meta team is. I think Nova had a pretty large representation of commandos, but it's always good to hear that some other regions aren't quite as competitive or as diehard on switching over to diff- different teams. Hmm. Inter- intercessors are always a, a, a constant, right? <laughs> but I think that's yeah, I think that's the I same with everyone. 
I think Space Marine typings have always been very common. So like Legionary, Intercession, and Phobos have always been very, very popular just because they mm. exist. <laughs> I think the mere fact that they exist is enough for some people. And now we have Strike Force Justian, so I'll, I'll see that this weekend. I'm curious to see how well they do at the the monthly. Oh, it'd be interesting for sure. Yeah, I kind of have high hopes for them. Uh, they they look simple. They look solid. Yeah. Yeah, definitely on the simpler side, but with, you know, lots of different stats. So who knows? They might be more than some of their parts when you actually get to playing them. Yeah, plenty of good tools there. Um, so I'm curious about when it comes to the types of events, you said that there's a lot of casual players too. Like are, are some of these events a little bit more like catered to that? Are you doing any like narrative stuff? um like what's the the ca- the more casual side look like look we, we host things like community days and and community days is something where we turn around and partner with stores um to hold a space to to invite people in who might have heard about the game are curious about the game and just want to wrap their heads around it and a really successful one um that was run recently over a good games miranda with a good mate of mine screech aka shannon shannon's his real name um he he basically he and i went in there we had about 18 people turn up during the course of the day and we were probably there for four hours we ran a whole bunch of learning games in there so so learning an intro game so people come coming in and not knowing how to play the game and we just run them through the basics so we keep uh tack ops um and um strategic and tack ploys out we we and sometimes even equipment because obviously you know walking in for the first time it, it could melt your brain the game but um, we ran that, and like since then, you know, Screech has been running Monday nights over at Good Games Miranda um, for people to come in as well. So, so little exercises and activities like that really um, put not only stores on the map, but but flag it as a space to go there and get an experience for Kill Team. So, so introing people into the game that way has been really popular. And I think um, you know, uh, Jason Jaspoon mentioned it on his uh, on his uh, session with you with yourselves as well. You know, making sure people get a warm introduction to the game um, is really important, and then it spreads from there. So we've got people who play a good deal of narrative. You know, Martin runs a narrative over at the Combat Company um, down south. Dan um, ran a big narrative called um, Australis Invictus, which which literally had the potential to run across the country. So. It's really dependent on on what people want, but the best thing about it is, you know, kill teams for everyone. So you can come in and regardless whether you want a storyline and something narrative focused or you want a casual game, um, it's it's really just about the social aspect to it, getting together and, you know, just rolling some dice and having some fun. Yeah, I think having a soft landing pad for a new player, that's got to be one of the most important things for building a yeah. new community. Yeah, no, definitely. We've had people, you know, and it's really, it's really uh, interesting. They call it steel clubbing, you know, where people come in and just get absolutely blown off the table. And you know, we've had people who thought that's that's the good way to basically, you know, welcome people into the game. But unfortunately, it doesn't keep them around for long. I've seen, you know, across other gaming systems, 40k, etc., people getting uh, welcomed into the game but just getting destroyed off the table and not wanting to go back because obviously you know the types of people that play these games including myself you know we're, we're very much introverted so when we come to a situation where we want to invest and connect with community um, getting wiped off the table isn't the nicest experience unfortunately yeah i think locally when we have new players come to the tournaments i always remind players that the goal is for everyone to have fun so you can have fun mm. even while you're destroying someone as long as as you're playing if they're making like really big mistakes you know trying to make sure that they know that this might not be the good idea or you know the reason why you're doing something is here rather than just being mean and being like this is why i'm doing this i'm just going to destroy you and not be nice like being able to be a soft landing pad for a player at a very stressful event because you know the first tournament for some players is very stressful making sure that there's like a soft landing pad is is important and also just being friendly like you can lose as long as your opponent isn't a huge jerk about it like it might be it might be okay you know what? That's so important. And thankfully, um, at both GTs, um, we had a, a large contingent of first timers um, come to the events and it was received really well because the experienced players on the top of the table would turn around and, and, and use it as an opportunity to obviously maximize on points, but at the same time, you know, teach teach the new guys more about the game. Yeah, love that. It's an important part of Sweater Kit, right, Jason? It definitely is. Um, I'm also kind of curious. Um, so you said you had a lot of first timers there. Was there 
do you would you say that there's any like easy to identify tricks or like circumstances that you think led to that extra little burst of first timers like any kind of like uh, a discord you want to shout out that's pretty active or like posters with qr codes or anything like that if you've got any secret weapons that have helped with the growth yeah look that so so we we run facebook groups as well as discords but the 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 leaders in the community aside from myself because we've all taken a particular spot in sydney close to our homes and and near supporting stores i mean shannon screech he the, the guy who who i ran the community day out at good games miranda with he grew that from zero to about seven players now, and all of them turned up, or six of them turned up, including him, for the for their first GT. And it's really about the people who kind of lead these pods and, and the momentum they drive with the community. So, so our Discord, the Good Times Roll Discord, we, we run a lot of um, engagement in their painting competition. So we've got something in there for everyone, but but a credit out to all the, to all the leads who run their areas because they they – teach their guys how to play they run learning games they run you know strategic games you know screech was running you know um uh, tips and tricks leading up to the last gt and so are the other guys but but people like uh people like um stamp liam pixel and uh john you know really drive the community and if you if you go to the kill team new south wales facebook page every time they run an event you can get a, a game six nights a week in Sydney. Um, they take photos, you know, selfies. They post it up. So people who might be a little bit shy to, to come out of their shell or out of their homes and play a game see that there's an actual scene happening. It's not just a picture of minis and terrain, etc. And they do an amazing job at it. Yeah, that's great. Six nights a week, solid. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm trying to get out like twice a week at this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm only allowed out two days a week from the boss. But um, they do it really well, and the guys in Melbourne as well have been doing a phenomenal job. So, so three nights a week, definitely, you can get a game in Melbourne. Um, and Tom, Chica, um, Dan, um, Lap, uh, Saruvius, and Stuart um, have been doing an awesome job down there. Stuart's a little bit more regional, um, but he's he's created a pot of his own um, out in Ballarat, and it's just growing from strength to strength. So it's been going really well. Nice. Are you guys planning to do a like Australian nationals, kind of like the Polish nationals or the French nationals that we've heard about on the podcast? That is is actually happening next weekend in Melbourne. We're all flying down for it. So it's hosted by the Oceanic Champion Circuit um, down in Mm -hmm. Melbourne. Um, And it's... um, and it's going to be an exciting one. So, so it's two golden tickets um, have been organized, as far as I understand, um, by Josh. Massive shout out to Josh Diffie. Um, but that's been going, uh, you know, really well. So we've been running all of our events. Um, so the both GTs as well as um, uh, ITC under that banner, and it's been going from strength to strength. Um, Lap and the team have been in Melbourne have been running um, pods, um, smaller pods down there as well of tournaments. It's just been growing. Momentum for, for events is really challenging to get going, but once they get going and the community gets behind it, it just it just gro- it just grows from strength to strength and. Across the country, we've all been doing our part to just kind of bring the community alive, and it's been working really well. So have there been times when things felt a little stale? I know during the summer, you know, at least in the U.S., during Melee summer, things kind of cooled off a little. What did Australia do or what did Sydney do specifically when things were maybe cooling off a little bit uh, meta-wise? Yeah, look, and and even now, right? There's a bit of a lull between the next box. Whenever that decides to to rear its head, it has been going a little bit, you know, quietly. But but what we've been doing, um, and I can only comment from a Sydney perspective. But what we've been doing in Sydney is we've been running leagues. So leagues that run over weeks. I mean, we've got one now, which which uh, which is in its third iteration. So we've had three so far that I've dubbed Killzone Sydney, that um, 
is all across Sydney, um, is about 12 weeks. So one game every two weeks, just to manage that work-life balance for people. Um, and there's a team element involved as well, where you can go to other stores. The stores that I mentioned run mm. six nights a week or go to different areas and invade territory and actually, you know, fight people um, for uh, supremacy of um, territories. And I've got a little graphic that's going to go up soon because we've just finished our first fortnight on there with like little flames and shields and swords. Um, and because each um, each location has got their own team, so we've got the Exiled that plays at Exiled's Gaming Club. We've got the Area 51, which is uh, the team I'm part of at RC Crew Games. The Eastern Executioners, you know, are over on the East. Um, uh, skill Issue, um, a Gene Stealer ate my baby, and a, and a couple more. We, we actually go and we invade territories. Oh, Chill on the Hill, that was the last one. But we go and invade territories and we play for supremacy, and that's just added a fun element to it, which is really, you know, driving momentum when when there is a lull. Um, a, another thing we, uh, we do as well is we drive a lot of opportunity for, for people to go and meet other people during these nights um, at the league. So instead of staying in your own pod in your own store, you make the trip out, you go meet people, and that's how the community grows. Yeah, so uh, my whole scene over here in Minnesota was all like unified in one place. And then when we kind of got scattered by some weird circumstances, and then we, we set up a bunch of game nights all over the cities, we also used a league once again to get people to kind of like cross between the different areas where we were setting up the little the little cells, the little pods, the little gaming scenes. So anyone that would sign up for the league would get random opponents. And then it would be like, then I'll, you know, I'll drive to the South side of the cities and play with someone that I haven't seen for a while over there. And um, it is a really good tool and it's really cool to, to hear about you guys doing something similar there as well. Yeah. And, and the whole forming of the teams was a really cool and exciting way to just bring people together as well. So we got logos created for all the teams um, and, and, you know, people play under those banners now at the competitive events, which is super cool. So so even when people go to a tournament now, they will play under their team banner and we're gonna get shirts and merch made as well, just to just to make it a little bit more communal. So so that works really well. And then taking that element into a league just, just drives the momentum and community further. Yeah, that's great. Um, when it comes to the stuff like capturing territories, I'm wondering if that was at all inspired by the way that the Ashes of Faith campaign works, because I know it's that whole thing is kind of built on like a similar vibe to what you were explaining. And I'm wondering if all if that was like a factor at all. Not really. In all honest, in all honesty, no. Um, we we ran it. We ran it during the first during the first league that happened a while back. We didn't get to finish it because it tapered off into the the festive season with with Christmas and New Year's. But um, we had that running back there, and that was like way before Ashes. So yeah. Not to say we thought about it first, but yeah, no, no relation whatsoever. And it was just a, a cool mechanic to keep everybody, you know, inspired and excited to want to go out to different areas and, and, and have a crack at playing um, competitively against others. Yeah, that's cool. Well, so I guess on that note, I'll throw it out there for anyone that hasn't looked at it. The like the narrative mode in Ashes of Faith is super cool. It's definitely worth a look. Um one of the guys in my local scene here uh, was actually Will, who we had on the podcast earlier as well, um, put together a little thing. And it was like a one day tournament that was inspired by the way the campaign works for Ashes of Faith. So like we had eight people show up and it, there was like four people for Chaos, four people for Inquisition. And then we it was three different games just all in the one day. And it was all like part of this, like fighting over territory. And like, there's this little mini game that's part of it where you like bid agents to go gather influence and control in different areas. And it, it, it was really fun. So I think they have some of the best designed uh, final missions, too. Yeah, it was, it was really Which cool. Which ones did you play, Jason? Um, so the were drawn like we had one that was from the current from like the crit ops. And then we did one from like the throwback and then we did one that was from ashes of faith uh and that was the last one and that was all like the chaos rituals mm -hmm. um so the the chaos ritual like the one that i had to do was the one where someone performs a ritual on the center line and they can't fight back or shoot or do anything but they give it a five up feel no pain and if they like if you, you you have to like do it for the entire duration of round three, meaning you have to start it in round two, 
and then survive mm. all the way through three and then all the way through four. And if you do that, you're pretty much going to win because it'll give you 12 on primary. Yeah. Yeah, I think for anyone who hasn't seen them, all the missions have very unique mechanics. Yes. The two other ones are, uh, there's a center line that has basically uh, a lowering VP point spread as you go down from the primary one that gets activated. And it's activated by someone who knows out of the five, one of them is the active point, but your opponent controls it. So the Chaos Cultist like knows where to start the ritual, but no one knows where it's going to start. And then it like cascades out, which is a fun scoring indicator. And then the other one is a chaos star or like a six pointed star. And as you shoot between stars, you actually like lose ballistic skill because it's like waves of force. So very, they're very well designed narrative things. Wow. So definitely, definitely a fun mission in case, uh, you know, anyone is looking for something more casual to do rather than just a serious tournament. Yep. Definitely recommend checking it out got leagues you've got narratives you know i run a narrative locally that you know is a nice landing spot for newer players i think it gives you an easy spot to play games regularly and you know just a little bit less serious of an environment compared to a gt or even just a local tournament but bands what else have you been doing to grow the community i'm sure that a discord is involved but it sounds like you use facebook too have you found any of the specific tools are better than others or do they all have their place Look, the, the Facebook groups act more like a uh, notice board. So events and so forth, people post up, you know, um, what they've been doing when games are happening. You know, we, we run Whip Wednesdays in there as well. I also shoot out a message at the start of the week. And in Discord, it's a lot more active because obviously, well, like, I think we're up, uh, up to 940 people on the Discord, but a lot gets lost in the chatter. But we've really gone to the effort to build the community. And I've got, um, you know, people like... Uh, P1K, Emma, Tom, Theruvius, Screech, and Sam helping me run that Discord. And and we run it for the community. So it's not attached to anything. It's literally for the community, by the community. And we do everything in there. We we, we have a marketplace in there where people can buy, swap, sell. We we also um, post all the tournament information that's happening across the country in there. You know, we run Kill Team specific painting competitions. We know we, we just ran a It Takes Two competition, which is, you know, two minis, uh, a pair who, who play on your team um, to encourage people to paint and build their teams and bring them to the table across the country and we also do um, a a number of different activities so we host fireside chats in there as well and we've had the pleasure of having Cyrac in there the guys from Mountainside Tabletop so far Um, we've also um, welcomed you know Reese from Threes to Wound in there he was our first we hope to have you guys in there shortly so we just try and bring value and and the community to, to Australia where we can as well because we're so far removed geographically from everyone else that you know getting support from the from the global community um is, is super important so we appreciate you know opportunities like this to, to to let people know what we're doing um and how they can potentially get involved but a lot of people um have provided some insight in there as well like um ace is in our discord server he's been uh, commenting and chiming in we've got dakota Ma- a massive shout out to dakota because he provides a lot of guidance and, and has assisted a great deal in some of the tournaments we've been running um and, and some insights on how he he does things for LVO. Um, so it's it's just really great that we've had, you know, the, the support from the global community to come in and help us build something that they've got a lot of experience in, but that we're just, you know, very early days, you know, even just a year into it. Um, so yeah, support and guidance from them and people like Lazarus is super important. Man, just a big group effort getting everybody involved. It sounds like your yeah. Discord community is uh, quite active, which is really cool to hear. Yeah, no, it is. Um, it, you know, we, we took a lot of time to set it up really well. You know, it's boosted. We've had, um, you know, a, a, a me six bot investment. Um, making sure that the Discord's there to, to, to serve the community and, and so they can access the information that they want and have the opportunity to connect with, you know, experienced people and bounce questions off others is, is really important because that's where the value comes into it, right? Especially when we've got people who sit, again, Australia being so geographically um, spread out, um, when we've got people, you know, sitting in Tasmania, which is a tiny little island um, south of Australia, but they've got the opportunity to play TTS. And we've run a couple of TTS tournaments as well in our Discord server. When they've got the opportunity to play, you know, they don't feel so far removed. And and it connects us to the Western side 
of Australia really well as well. And there's a lot of people who play TTS there too. Yeah, I guess with Australia being such a large continent, it is it is useful to have a digital playground. Oh no, definitely, definitely bringing everybody together and offering and and what we've noticed as well is that people of a older age demographic prefer Facebook and people of a younger age demographic prefer Discord. So so we try and cater to to everyone as as much as possible. Yeah, that's actually a good note. Maybe I should be using Facebook a little bit more. <laughs> you're much younger than i am i think you're all right <laughs> well no i feel like maybe i should be using facebook to try to reach out to some more people who might be interested in kill team or might be soured on oh. 40k right now it sounds like maybe 40k is in a okay spot from what i've heard from some other players i think for the casual level player maybe 10th is great because it's just a new playground compared to before yeah i i feel for anybody who wants to grow a community uh to to two-pronged strategy between facebook and discord is really good um because a lot of stuff gets lost in the chatter on discord um but in facebook it's just one spot you can post things up and a lot of people can contribute to it or comment on it so it's definitely worth worth looking into do you find that your newer players are gravitating towards certain teams certain releases or i know when we talked to i think ace he mentioned that his community plays like people come out of the woodwork when a box appeals to them. Have you found mm. something similar? Or is it a, like a really diehard contingent that's pulling in their friends? It's look, it, honestly, it's a, uh, I would say it's a mix. Um, so we've had a couple of instances where people are bringing their friends, but in a lot of instances, it's just turning up people knowing that there's something there and then coming out of the woodwork and, and, Screech does this really well. He, he he encourages the rule of cool, right? So getting into the game and getting emotionally connected to the game is is first and foremost about what you think is cool and what you think is awesome playing. Um, and that might be Felgor Ravages, you know, a bunch of screaming goats, but um, uh, and they're super fun to play, right? But then people will start to find out, you know, if they're going more after a shooty team, more after a slashy team, a horde team, an elite team. So we... we what we've what we've invested a lot in um, uh, are teams for people to play as well. So I've bought at least one of every box that's come out um, and assembled teams. Um, and and what we do is we let people figure out what they want to play before they you know jump into an investment. But you know to your point, Travis, there are people who have bought boxes and like how do I play this thing? And we'll run them through that as well. But but the most important thing is that that people get a, a, a warm and proper intro into the game um and again see that there's a community behind it because there's nothing worse than investing in a game and not having a community that's there to support you to play your game that you're excited about or not knowing that one's there right yeah i think that's always the eternal problem with physical games because it's really easy to when you play an online game and there's a a queue for you basically mm. Mm. But the level of friction to get into a physical game is that much harder because you have to find well, at least one other person. I think in a lot of these games, it's like people who have played it with a friend for a long time and they just never play with other people. So getting bridging that gap is always really important. Yeah, and the guy, it's actually really interesting because the, the team over in WA, so P1K and Noon um, and a couple of the others, um, uh, you know, found it because Western Australia... If you think Australia is spread out um, and Sydney's a cluster where where we can get six nights a week, Western Australia is so spread out, it's not funny in, in their own state. And um, they're they're playing over at a place called Beyond in Balcatta, and they've got a big 40K community. But obviously, 40K and the brain loads are really intense sometimes. So they found a pocket there, and they're getting, well, in their peak, they were getting 13 people there a night. And the way they did it is was really gradual with the way they introduced the 40K players into the game. Because because obviously Kill Team being such a skirmish style game, you're a lot more intimate with your models than you are with 40K. You know, you lose a <laughs> you lose a whole squad in 40K, it's nothing, but you lose a single player in Kill Team and you feel a little bit emotional about it, right? And they had a really good three-step process to welcome people into the game. So, so making sure that's done properly is really key. I learned a lot from those guys. Okay, yeah. I think that I haven't done as much work on converting 40K players as of late just because i haven't had as much time to get out to the 40k store but yeah it's a good note it's a good note for anyone who's interested in starting a scene i think there's probably a handful of people that listen to this podcast but you know having the friend that you want to play games with and being welcoming and being like hey if you're done with your 40k game anybody want to try a kill team game 
definitely sounds like it's a consistent thing that has worked for at least more than one TO that's come on here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you find that having cheat sheets helps? Cheat sheets definitely helps. Yeah. But again, if it's the first... So, so I, I run a three-step process to introduce people to the game. First step yeah, is just basic movement again no no equipment no tech ops no strategic or tactical ploys just just raw movement hand-to-hand -hand combat introduce them into you know things like group activations um how many apl you know controlling objectives and so forth just the basic and then the second time they come back and we just use command points for re-rolls in the first instance and then when they come back a second time we might include equipment and then the third time we go into strategic ploys tactical ploys and tech ops just so again, their brain doesn't fry because we've we've ran games that have run close to three hours just on the basics, and people walk away, you know, looking a little bit hard done by. So just making sure that their understanding of the basics and getting into it has worked. That three step process of really probably uh, I would say seventy percent of the time people have come back for their second and third game and then gotten really into it. So that the more you make sure again, it's a gradual introduction because again, compared to a you know. PCG, it's it's a lot more intensive, it, intensive and much more of a brain load. But um, as long as you're doing it in a in a slow, progressive way, and that's that's the way that's worked best for me. It's it's come up really well in terms of community growth and expansion. Yeah, I think I'd even go a step further on that first one and not even use full teams. So I normally play like a half board with like maybe one or two objectives. I'm just like, yeah, just move around and shoot each other, and don't yeah, worry about right. how many models you have because it's you you don't actually need. 10 models for you to figure out like how movement works. It's just, you need a handful that way it's short. It's maybe like an hour and then mm. you can be like, all right, do you guys want to play with double the models and double the objectives? Cause then it lets them kind of choose their own adventure on how difficult they want that next experience to be. That's actually a really good idea, mate. I'm definitely going to implement yeah. that one. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, four steps now, four steps now, fans. <laughs> yeah. Four steps. <laughs> Yeah, but I think if that first step is even more bite sized it means that people can hop in, try it a little, and then if it like tickles the brain, it'll be really obvious for them because it's. And then it's like, oh, do you just want to sit down for a longer session with more stuff? Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm definitely going to implement that one. Yeah. Mm, all right. Sounds like maybe it's time for some operative showdown, Jason. Yeah, if we're ready, we're feeling good. We'll dive right into the Operative Showdown. Operative Showdown. This week, we are going to be talking about Gellerpox and specifically the bugs. We're talking about the fleas, the mosquitoes, the grubs. Um, just kind of diving into that a little bit. Um, touching on when do we want to use the GA2 pairs, when to split them up. What are the pros and cons? Are there any that you always take, any that you never take? Look, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I haven't played Gellapox since they got nerfed. I, play, I bought them initially and used them very sporadically, but it's a team that I'm going to get back into because I personally like playing teams that look cool, and Gellapox to me look really cool. Glitchlings worked best for me when I previously played them um, just because they caused a lot of issues for my opponents. And I know in some instances when I was playing against others, especially Legionary, because I played Legionary as well, um, making sure Glitchlings were really taking out as many people um, on the other side in terms of debuffing them was, was a key strategy for me. Okay, so instead of using the equipment, you were focused on the aura debuffing of the team members. Correct. Okay, well, I mean, that's, that's definitely taken a hit over the last couple months. Because they went from a six inch range to a three inch range. Three inch is still okay if you can position them properly. Yeah, before I think the problem was on an open room on in the dark, one glitch laying at like the edge of the room would just stop the room from being a shooting room, which was really rough for most teams. So you never got, did you, did you have any um, guiding principles uh, when it came to setting up your fleas or any of the other equipment bugs? Look, in all honesty, I played them twice. Just being completely ah, right. transparent, like yeah, Legionary right, was right. yeah, Legionary was my team that I stood by um, completely, wholly and solely, only because Chaos is close to my heart. <laughs> but um, right, I was right. getting into I was getting into Gellapox, and then the next team I was looking at was um, Warp Coven. I've been playing them a bit more um, than Gellapox, only because 
I didn't get a chance to complete painting them, um, the Gellapox. But um, yeah, Warp Coven is probably something I'm playing more now, and I'm running them in the current league. Um, so we're in the second, um, we're in the second round of the six round league um and i've taken warp coven specifically just to see how you know i, I can leverage them because they're very much a toolbox team and you know essentially you can go one wizard and a whole bunch of zangors and run a horde team or you can mix and match as necessary so they're probably the team i've had a little bit more experience with all right well i mean if we're going to go into operative showdown with the warp coven instead when do you take more zangors than marine bodies or oh, vice look. versa. Like, which matchup are you doing the different spreads for? Or conceptually, which ones do you think you would do it for? Look, cur currently, my my um, come one, come all team is three sorcerers. Um, two rubric means, one being the Soul Reaper Cannon, the other one, the Icon Bearer, and two Zangors. And the Zangors I take uh, is the one with the Great Axe and then the one with the Blades. And that's been working really well because, you know, you can feed Zangors um, and get people out and then, you know, counter them with um, Wizards or Soul Reaper Cannon. But w what I'm thinking about taking against the Blooded Match I've got next week is one Wizard and remaining Zangors, and the majority of those with Bolt Pistol and Chainsword. Only because I played a game against um, uh, Sam last night with my Legionaries, as I mentioned, and he had more bodies on the field and just purely activations. I was actually stuck on this map that we're that we're going to be using for the um for the grand tournament next weekend. And I was thinking to myself, if I had one wizard and 10 Zangors, I'd actually be better off in this instance, just purely on activation and uh opportunity to to advance next round perspective. So I'm thinking against blooded, I definitely take Zangors, um, purely because of the activations. Okay, so you're taking mass Zangors when you want to go mano a mano, like operative to operative, and have a little bit more time. Because when you only have three rubrics or three sorcerers, you just don't have enough activations for these horde teams. Have Don't have enough activations, and again, depending on how they're deployed, not as much of an opportunity to, to take out as many as I'd like to. Cool, cool. Do you have any maybe like niche tactics plays that you have locked and loaded for the Warp Coven? Niche tactics. Look, so so um, teleporting the Soul Reaper Cannon after he's advanced forward and activated where possible um, and teleporting him to somewhere where he can um, definitely take more of an advantage next turning point is something I've been playing around with. Um, secondly, um, ensuring, yeah, and it depends on what, what um, boons you take, but um, ensuring I've got at least one uh completely hand-to-hand -hand, um uh sorcerer as well as one that sits on blast has been working really well um because obviously you know indirect if you're not on into the dark is is really strong against the horde team depending on how they've deployed and then getting in with a uh extra uh, appendage to pick up something and then using the tactical ploy to dash and go into conceal has worked really well Mm, okay, so the avian talent upgrade allows you to take a free action as long mission as it's a yeah. mission action. So that's one of the boons each for one of the sorcerers. One note for the warp fire portal: um, the warp portal can only move a model that has not moved on a turn. So you can't do it. You can't have a rubric move up and then get portaled and then. Uh, yeah, no. That's just, sorry. What I meant yeah, for yeah, the next like, turning point. Do correct. it over like two say two over two turns. Yes, the, correct. That's, over that's two that turns. Way. Okay, cool. So the the mutant appendage giving you the free mission action so that you can play the mission a little bit better when you're playing against teams that go go a little bit wide on maybe loot or secure. Mm. And I and I always take fly for my leader. Always. Okay. Uh, is the leader generally which which disciplines are you using across the board? Do you double up on tempiric or are you a destiny tempiric warp fire kind of warp cover no. player? D again, depending on who I'm going up against, I, I, I always try and take one of each uh, purely because of the opportunity to, to you know, have that diversity. Um, it really helps, um, especially if you're going up against a horde team. Um, but sometimes I'll take Flux Blast twice. Okay. Are you ever doing it with the equipment rather than doing it with just like two Tempiric disciplines? 
Um, sometimes yes, but but uh, again, I'd rather use the equipment for other things in a lot of instances, depending on who I'm going up against. So Dest- I try and take Destiny always for my leader. Um, T- Tempiric is is something I'll take if I'm going against a Horde team, but the but the Warp Fire definitely has its um benefits as well i mean when you can cast em- ephemeral instability at least once um it helps a lot um but if you can cast it twice and you've got the opportunity you know to, to do temporal manipulation to, to uh, heal someone it, it works as well but yeah normally rule of thumb is one of each um depending on who i play nice and have you been finding you're getting a lot of use out of the newly buffed exalted astartes or are you not because you're using two rubrics right now have you found that you're going to double shoot or you're using slow and purposeful from time to time uh look honestly i'm not really i haven't really leveraged the buff yet because i'm getting back into the mechanics of the actual team but Mm -hmm. i'd probably shoot twice in all honesty yeah, I think when I've been playing Warp, I've been playing Warp Coven a little bit on my uh, for funsies right now, and I'm taking them to a tournament. I think in a couple of weeks, uh, I've used the double shoot a couple of times now, which has, has been pretty potent, especially when you have an icon bearer that can double fire and mm-hmm. the Soul Reaper cannon that can double fire. That's very yeah. very powerful, especially if you can launch the Soul Reaper cannon into a inopportune spot for your opponent. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. So against like the elites, I think. You know, the fact that your rubrics can double shoot makes a big deal on the elite matchup, which used to be, I think, very, very hard for the team to manage. So get some usages there. And don't forget that you can always do the mutant herd. So if you're taking a lot of Zangors, you can have Mm. a Zangor blow the horn, charge into someone with the extra inch of movement and have the mutant herd be someone actually important to go surprise your opponent and lock people up ahead of time. Because the at that point, if you've done the charge with the horn blower and lock someone up, he's already done a useful thing. And then the mm. person with a sword or something else now has the extra inch that your opponent wasn't expecting to have to deal with in, you know, a chain activation. So making sure that your Zangors are within three inches of each other for the mutant herd tactical ploy is really nice when you're playing more more Zangors. So hopefully if you use ten Zangors, you'll get some use out of that. Ooh, that's a good spicy one. Is so mutant herd for anyone that doesn't know is the uh, the group activation thing, right? Mm, correct. You can have a Zangor within three inches of another Zangor invisible at chain activate, basically. And I that's guess if you're taking ten Zangors, you're also just sm- smearing all of them with gilded horns, so they have single use lethal five, right? Yeah, correct. Especially especially with the um uh Bolter and chainsword for sure. Yeah, no, it seems it seems like a fun. I mean, I the cool thing about Zangors, at least on the roster side, is they're reasonably flexible. But the only issue with them is when you get out to a twenty man roster, being switching between Zangors actually does end up mattering in tournament play. So I suppose in a league format where you don't have a locked in roster, it a little it's a little bit more free. But interestingly enough, in tournament play, having a ten Zangor list can be problematic as far as having actual options when you come to which sorcerers you're taking. Yeah, no, definitely. And look, I'm literally <laughs> with the amount of uh, effort I put into the to the community and just you know going around and teaching people. It, the, the one one um, unfortunate byproduct out of that is my game has gone down dramatically. So I'm slowly but surely picking that up, um, you know, in the league. So yeah, I'll definitely be be reaching out and just getting some tips from you, Travis, on on how to basically build a better team. Yeah, I mean, I I think they're they're in a fun spot. I don't know how good they are because they mm. have a lot of tools. And while they are a toolbox team, none of their tools feels particularly overwhelming at this point. So whether or not that flexibility is enough to really drive them to a win against some of the stronger teams right now, I'm not sure. But they are very fun to play. Having a whole team with five of invulns means that you're never really at a loss for what you're going to do when you get shot. You can just pray to Zinch for things to go just as he planned. Unless you get diced. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's just part of the game, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, look, I, I play teams that I think are fun to play. And when I go to play games, I don't play to win. I play to have a good time, right? I like walking away from games. And I played a really good game um, against Jimmy the other night with my Legionaries 
versus his uh, Corsair Void Scout. And um, it was a very, very challenging game because he's, I think he's ranked number two for uh, Corsairs globally. And um, he just plays them so well. So he, he really leverages, um, you know, uh, his setups really well. And I was playing him against my Legionaries, but um, understanding exactly how to play each team is, is just all part of the fun for me. So, yeah, I, I go with the rule of cool and what looks cool, but then, yeah, I like understanding how they play. Yeah, I think we'll leave it there then, right? I think that's a good note. Making sure to learn as much as you can as you play and never getting too discouraged when things don't go the way you want them to. Yes, after all, it is a game and we're all here to have fun. You have any uh, last shout outs you want to call out, bands, stores, discords, uh, upcoming tournaments? Sounds like you've got the the nationals coming up. So if you want to give us a little discussion on uh, what's going on there, how many players you're expecting, you know, tell us about it. Yeah, sure. Again, so it's being hosted in Melbourne by the Gaming Arena. Um, again, massive shout out to Josh. I'm just super excited. I think there's about 28 of us going down um, from, you know, a few states across the country, which is pretty cool. Um, I think I understand as far as I understand that there's a couple of uh, golden tickets uh, over to Atlanta from that. So so people are definitely going to be playing for that. But just a massive shout out to the Australian community. I mean, everybody's done their little bit. You know, the guys up in far north Queensland, um, the guys over in WA, Small Worlds Cafe and ACT and just all the stores in Sydney and Melbourne that have supported us and all the guys that have been running um th- their pockets. It's been great. Yeah, it's been really good hearing hearing everything that's going on in Australia. I know Australia is a big place with a lot of players, so we're excited to see you guys come out to Atlanta. I'll and maybe, who possible. knows, maybe next year uh, some people will come out to the New York Open or the Renegade Wargaming Tournament that Jason's helping. Oh, definitely. I hope so. And look, from from our perspective, we're, we're hoping to put Australia on the map for, for international um, you know, players to come to us as well. So we hope to have something propped up next year. And if anybody wants to make a trip to the land down under, we'll only be more than happy to host you. Yeah, I mean, I know where I'm going to be pointing players in case they go to Australia and they want to get a game. For sure, mate. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, listeners for coming on and hanging out with us in the land down under. 